personally, what challenges have you faced working in what studying as well as working in the Indigenous Health Professions Program? Can you tell us more about that? Absolutely. So, um, people, one thing I've noticed very quick is that um, because we're kind of affiliated with McGill, uh, we're supporting um, on many levels, um, people still try to kind of use our program as kind of a shortcut to build these relationships with Indigenous communities. And okay. that is very much one of the issues that is kind of faced by you know, Indigenous people who accept researchers into their communities. Oftentimes, they're not fully consulted with. Um, the research is done, they pack up their data, they leave, they don't really talk to the community ever again, or let them know maybe what was going on while they were there. And there's that lack of kind of community consultation, but also inclusion, I think, that um, has always been an issue. And that's something that we're looking to alleviate. You know, we want to help people understand why community consultation is so important. And we do that by, you know, trying to advance curriculum, making sure that um, the schools are educating their general kind of health professional cohorts with an understanding of the circumstances that indigenous people have to face and that comes with its own challenges but of course you're gonna you still get the people these people who you know want to find shortcuts you know they want oh uh, can you you do you have connections with this community can you and, and right off the bat we want to just say yeah, yeah. That, that's that's not the way to you need to you need to meet with them. you got you got to talk with them right right you got to you know, let them know it's 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 not so much that you need to like work against their expectations but you you got to treat them like you know they're a party involved in this i mean they're they're beyond subjects and i think indigenous people for so long have been nothing but subjects in a lot of these. When we look at studies and policies, power has always been taken out of the hands of Indigenous people. And this is a very easy gesture to empower Indigenous people and let them feel, you know, like they have a say in these things. Right. They have a seat at the table. And so definitely communicating that to some people who have maybe done research a certain way their whole life, it, it, it is different for them. Um, for a lot of them, they're not used to kind of that process, but it's, it, it needs to happen if, you know, this relationship building is going to happen. And there's no shortcuts to that. I mean, you, you, you have to take the time and, you know, build these bonds with these communities. Right. So, yeah, a little, not that, a little bit of a challenge for us kind of communicating that, but the message has been going across. And, you know, we've been a program for you know, about maybe two years now, two and a half years, but it's slowly there is progress being made. It's going to be nice to see you know, what kind of comes from our involvement with uh, these faculties and uh, you know, relaying kind of things that we have zone between communities and university. You also mentioned that you get to visit these communities when you go as part of your outreach program. You said you enjoy that a lot. Um, is there anything else that you find fun about being in STEM, studying and working both? Um, one of the things that I do when I do these outreach visits as well is I always try to weave in that kind of um, the science teachings in an indigenous lens. And I'll do this, you know, I, I've made like a Jeopardy game, for example, that just basically, it talks about the science behind things, but it relays in things like hunting, you know, medicines that are found in land. The things that essentially led to the big boom of modern medicine. Um, kind of how all of this has always been integrated. And sometimes, you know, I think we don't think of it that way, especially uh, with the way it's taught in the classroom. And I like to send those as kind of reminders, but also little hints to maybe get their curiosity flow. Um, something that I'm actually really excited to do is I'm going to be going back to my community in the fall and. Um, I have connections with the school you know, growing up there. My father's a teacher, I have a good relationship with the school. Um, they have an agreement with uh, a hunter to bring in a moose. Um, and they're gonna har and they're gonna harvest it. Well, I wanna make sure that the meat is harvested afterwards, but I'm gonna leave this section with the school um, with some of the organs of this moose. And so I'm trying to, I wanna integrate language into it. I wanna be able to you know, make sure that the meat is very much still usable afterwards. Yeah. Um, all the while kind of giving students a real hands-on kind of science lesson. And I, I'm, I'm very you know, filled with pride when it comes to things like that because it's, it's a way for me to really you know, attach these two things that I'm very passionate 
I should really help me do it. I get to do the science, but I get to approach it from a standpoint from my own culture. Right, right. I feel very privileged to do that. Uh, so being someone from an indigenous community, you've been exposed to our notion of science, the contemporary notion, as well as the indigenous notion of science. What exactly does it mean to you? How do you make sense of both these notions together? I got the experience of seeing a, a talk by uh, Dr. Leroy Little Bear. It was at the uh, Canadian Indigenous Science and Engineering Society's first kind of annual meeting in, um, it was in Calgary. And one of the things that he very much, you know, all and cases I should talk about is this is an initiative for Indigenous students who are currently in STEM. Um, and this is a way for them to network, to you know, meet employers if they're coming from more of the professional aspects of engineering, for example. And um, in his talk, he mentioned something that you know, I very much have like, held the heart. And it's this idea that, you know, he, he mentioned how two students, two Indigenous students had walked up to him before and had said, how can I integrate more Indigenous like, science into you know, contemporary science? And he mentioned how to really be able to understand indigenous science, it has to come back to the language. It has to come back to indigenous languages because in the translation, oftentimes meanings are lost. Um, I think the example he, that he brought up was trees, for example. Uh, the word for them in his language uh, is to translated to peasants. And immediately off the bat, you can see in kind, of, kind of how that translation works. That relationship to the land, the, the way of living is tied directly in just one word. And um, that, that kind of, you know, when you apply that to, you know, ethics, for example, um, it just speaks volumes. And it doesn't even have to say much because it's very much, it's the life stuff. It's the way of thinking. Right. And so, it can be really challenging sometimes to kind of take these, you know, more Western kind of science approaches and, you know, think back to things that I grew up with or think back to you know, teachings that I've received. And so it's not an easy process for sure. It's, it's, it's not very, it's, it's sometimes it can even conflict, but it just means that in, at the end of the day, it just takes a little bit more work. I think from both parties, from, you know, being able to communicate kind of these teachings and for science to, or modern science to be more, be a little more inclusive of these ways of thinking. Yeah. And oftentimes it, you know, this changes the way how resources are harvested. Um, the understanding of how something can impact uh, another, uh, medications even, kind of inclusion of, you know, the ways we look at health, for example, oftentimes so here indigenous people, they, they look at health as uh, more expansive than just you know, mental and physical. You'll, they'll throw around spiritual and emotional health oftentimes. And it's, it's a challenge, but it's really, at the end of the day, it's very worthwhile to kind of find a way of incorporating these you know, bits of knowledge that have been in the indigenous community since time immemorial within kind of this modern context of what science is. So it's, it's, it's always a challenge to find a common ground between the two, but it's very, it's, it's fulfilling when you do it. it it's, it's very, very fulfilling. Has there been any instance that over the years you've learned about that could help you overcome these challenges? And if you knew it before, let's say, a good piece of advice that would help you overcome some of these challenges? Um, when I first came to Mago, um, I was here for about a year and what wound up happening was I was going through a lot in my life. Uh, you know, leaving my community was you know, a tough thing to do first off, but I was also kind of struggling with a lot of mental health issues at the time and you know, I was in some personal issues as well. Um, and this all kind of spiraled until I, it was affecting my kind of academic life. and. I did poorly enough that you know, I was asked to actually leave the university. And I think you know, for a lot of indigenous students out there you know, who are going through these kind of struggles, um, in the indigenous community, unfortunately, there's this kind of stereotype of you know, being a dropout, you know, whether it's in secondary or post-secondary education. This is an ongoing theme of people who you know, just something didn't work out in the classroom. And, it becomes 
kind of not even an option for them afterwards. And I very much struggled with that. But one of the things that really pulled me out of kind of that, um, you know, that disbalance in my life I was going through was um, going back to my community. Years, you know, uh, I'm very fortunate that my mother's a teacher in the community. So I interacted you know, in a classroom setting you know, almost every day. I you know, helped around with her classroom. Sometimes you know, I was asked to be a substitute teacher. And the way that I was kind of going about that role, um, the students quickly picked up on kind of how I was orienting myself. And, you know, they bring it up to me and my mother, but, you know, they said like, oh, he's really good at teaching. They said, you know, you should be a teacher. And, you know, I always say, I, I don't think I can do what my mother does. Uh, you know, the teachers are amazing, but ooh, I, I don't know if I can handle what they have to go through. Yeah. But they did pick up on the notion that, I had this passion and this curiosity for you know, science and education. And it was really going back home for me that was the driving factor for me, you know, reapplying to McGill and getting in. And second time around, what one of the things that I was a lot better with was I included a lot of these kind of groundings and teachings I received from you know, being home and being from where I'm from. Um, and it really helped me uh, the second time around. I, I, you know, I, I tell that to a lot of Indigenous people, you know, first and foremost, I tell them, your first summer, whenever you, like, when you're uh, done your first semester of school, go home. <laughs> like, go home and be amongst your, your own people. It's, uh, it's important to reconnect, I think. And oftentimes, you know, we get so bogged down with kind of modern life, especially in an urban setting, that it's really hard to kind of incorporate these, you know, these right. ways of living and these uh, you know, traditions that we grow up with. And it becomes a it becomes a balancing act, but I think regrounding is really important. Uh, visit home as often as you can, but also you know you're given a tool set at the same time. Um, you know we have each within our proper nations and our own kind of indigenous peoples. We all have these kind of ways of looking at you know, keeping balance in life. It's mentally, physically, emotionally, spiritually, and so forth. And you can take those in the modern set. And those, are, those teachings are there to help you in times of hardship. Okay. And academics is very much, it could be argued that academics is like a ceremony. It's sacrifice. It's um, putting yourself through you know, these intense odds against you for you know, stress yeah. purposes, for work, and so, like the skill set development you're going through. They're very stressful um, settings. But we've been granted these tools to help us through hardship. And, Academics is included in that. But these kind of tool sets that we were given long ago by our ancestors, and, you know, things that we still do in our communities. Just because you're not there at the moment doesn't mean that you know you can't take that with you. You, know, you, you bundle that up and take it with you because in the end that's medicine and that's there for you when you need it. And so I always tell people, you know, that is a, a surefire way you can incorporate kind of. Uh, you know, things that can make this process um, less painful, but also easier for you.